Bonnie Haim. Bonnie Haim married at age 18, and five years later, she found herself a young wife and mother living in Florida with her husband, Michael, and working at a construction company. It was clear to everyone in the office it was not a good marriage. Their boss witnessed an event where Michael was abusive to Bonnie outside, slamming her hand in the car door and breaking all of her nails off. So it wasn't a huge surprise to anyone when Bonnie confided in her friends and family that Michael Haim was abusive and she couldn't take it anymore. She planned to leave him, taking her son Aaron with her. To be able to execute this plan, Bonnie needed money, so she secretly opened a bank account with hopes of escaping someday. She was devastated when her husband discovered the account. He forcibly drove her to the bank and forced her to close the account, giving him all of the money. It didn't stop her from starting over though, and she learned from the event. She quietly gave money to her friends to hold for her once she was able to escape. In December of 1992, Bonnie had a solid plan. She and Aaron were finally going to start over. She had already put down a deposit on a new apartment and she enrolled Aaron in a new preschool. Then suddenly, before the Christmas lights had even faded, Bonnie disappeared from her Jacksonville home. Bonnie's disappearance, in fact, wasn't even reported to anyone. It was passed off as being her choice. The next day, Michael called in sick and neither Michael or Bonnie showed up. Her killer carelessly dumped her purse in a hotel dumpster to get rid of it. However, it was found and it was turned into the police. This ended up being the only reason she was reported missing, because the police had her purse. Michael seemingly wasn't worried at all. The police promptly found her car at the airport, but there was no record of her flying anywhere. Police also noted that on the seat of the car, it was pushed way back, as if someone much taller had been driving. In addition, they found a clear footprint inside the car that was matched to Michael's shoes. Police noted his demeanor was off. He was clearly not upset at all that his wife was missing. This was when a child psychologist was brought in to interview the three-and-a-half-year-old son. Aaron made very clear statements that day. Daddy hurt mommy. Daddy shot mommy. Daddy placed mommy in a timeout. And that daddy couldn't wake mommy up. Bonnie's parents, however, were very sure that Michael had nothing to do with her absence. Her father, Robert, in fact, stated publicly at many times that you cannot trust the credibility of a child and claimed that his grandson had lied before. He was clear that he found nothing suspicious at all in how Michael acted after his daughter went missing. He said that women leave their families all the time and the family never expects it. Michael Haim told officers that he and Bonnie got in a fight about the state of their marriage. His story went that Bonnie stormed out of their home at 11 p.m. that night without her son and just disappeared into thin air. It simply didn't occur to him to report her disappearance. He felt she just went to her mother's house. Michael even admitted that he knew she was planning to leave him and take their son. Police suspected she was a victim of foul play and that her husband was at fault, but there was no body and no proof. However, unlike his grandfather, a court believed the boy. In 2005, a civil court judge ordered Michael to pay his son $26.3 million in damages for leaving him the only witness to Bonnie's murder and therefore at risk for harm. This is how he came to own the house that he grew up in. Michael's own aunt went on record to be clear that she felt Michael did something to hurt Bonnie, that Bonnie wouldn't just disappear and not contact anyone ever again. Yet there still wasn't any tangible proof, at least not until 21 years later when Aaron was removing a poorly constructed slab in the house that he won, finding something entirely unexpected, a skull and beneath it appeared to be teeth. A stunned Aaron called his therapist to say he thinks he just found his mom. It seems incredulous that the police would notice a slab of concrete that was new on the side of the house that she'd been there all along. The cause of death for Bonnie couldn't be verified, but it was ruled to be homicide. There was an indication she may have been shot in her pelvis, but that couldn't be verified. Although inside the grave, they did find a spent shell that matched a gun that was owned by Michael. For Bonnie's family, it was bittersweet. They finally had proof that Bonnie didn't just disappear. Michael Haim was again under the microscope. He would be quickly arrested in North Carolina and extradited back to Florida. It would turn out he was living in Florida on a settlement he got for Bonnie's life insurance money. At the trial, Michael was adamant that he loved his wife. He didn't hurt her. He would go on to claim that she was having an affair and that that person must have killed her and buried her on the property. His defense was that anyone could have moved her there. However, he had no proof of that affair and nobody knew of one. A now adult Aaron took the stand and told the story to the audience. When he was six, he asked his adopted parents if they could go searching for his mom, and they said yes. He immediately walked into the garage and grabbed a shovel. He went on to say, I have always known that my mom was buried. I just didn't know where. I tried, but I couldn't remember. Michael Haim was found guilty of second-degree murder, and after only a 90-minute jury deliberation. Before sentencing, Michael's second wife would go on to order the judge pray before sentencing. She went on to say that Michael loves Jesus. Michael Haim was sentenced to life in prison. 
This is not the end of the story, however, as Michael couldn't help but brag inside of the prison that he got away for 26 years after killing his wife. He couldn't help but brag about choking her and his son seeing it and being mad. He then claimed it was simple to just bury her in the yard. Aaron's memories have faded over time. At sentencing, Bonnie's sister, Liz Peake, told the judge how Michael's crime tore her family apart from the beginning, explaining she was only 26 and she tried to be there for Aaron and do the right thing and obtain custody. This angered her family because they believed that Michael was innocent and that their daughter had walked away. She went on to say, Michael Haim somehow convinced my parents that I was the evil person for trying to get Aaron. She explained that her parents eventually refused to speak to her or her children ever again as a result. Her family was literally torn apart because they believed that Michael had nothing to do with Bonnie's leaving. She lost not just her sister, but her parents also. There's no indication whether or not Bonnie's parents were still alive when Michael was sentenced for the murder of his wife. Hopefully there's some way for that family to come back together. That's it for today. Thank you for watching and listening. Please take a moment to subscribe if you haven't yet, and perhaps even comment. Take care of yourselves and each other.